Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Humankind has perhaps always wanted to fly. So when ballooning became possible, it was a worldwide sensation. And the Berkshires were at the forefront of America's adventure in this new and astounding technology. In 1783, on November the 21st, the first free flight, which was an untethered balloon carrying two men aloft, took place in Paris, France. The balloon was constructed of silk and paper, and the men stood on a flat circular disc with a fire in the middle. It was lifted by the hot air, created by those flames. But the fire was considered dangerous, which it was, and hard to keep going, as it needed to be tended constantly. So those interested in flight tried to think of a better way. There were earlier toy balloons, essentially paper bags that were filled with hot air over a fire and then let go to float aloft for a short while. But it took the discovery of lighter-than-air gases before a method was founded substantial enough to fill much larger balloons that were able to then carry humans. Only ten days after this first French flight, another French flight took place. Again, two men took to the air in a balloon filled with hydrogen gas. It was in January of 1784 that the first American article about ballooning was published in Boston Magazine, and it wasn't until October of 1860 that a balloon was seen floating above that same city, tied to the ground with ropes. And from there, pictures were taken of Boston from above. In 1895, the Boston Aeronautical Society was formed. Most balloons at this time used gases to achieve lift, but this meant that the sport of ballooning could not take place too far away from a city that had a gas works, where lighter-than-air gases could be obtained. Hydrogen was dismissed, for the most part, after a horrific accident involving a balloon filled with a highly flammable gas and open flame during an attempt to cross the English Channel. So the first commonly used gas was helium, because of its relative ease to obtain and its stability. But that didn't mean that people gave up on the other methods, by any means. They continued to fine-tune these evolving techniques while experimenting with proven ones. Setting up a balloon took time. The balloon would be packed in a large crate or bag, deflated, then laid out on the ground flat. From there, the balloon would be filled with tanks of gas while it was tied to the ground, and it would slowly inflate. Once it was inflated and floating above the ground, brave people would climb aboard into the basket or onto a platform, and the ropes tying the balloon down would be cut loose. It was then that the balloon would take to the air and drift away. Those inside were terribly brave, for they were for the most part at the mercy of the wind. There was no way to steer. The knowledge that the wind often moved in different directions at different altitudes was still being discovered. A small flap could be opened at the top of the balloon which would allow some of the gas to escape, and thus let the balloon sink. If those inside wished to go up again, sandbags could be dropped. This would lighten the load, and the balloon could float higher. Sometimes, if an obstacle had to be avoided, but all of the sandbags, the ballast, had already been dropped, everything extra in the basket would have to be pitched over the side as well. Ropes, tools, hats, coats, all the extra weight had to go. The Berkshires were at the forefront of a lot of innovation at the time, and the sciences involved in taking to the air were one of them. Pittsfield and North Adams became hot spots for the sport of ballooning, so much so that later on, Norman Rockwell included a hot air balloon in an idyllic scene depicting Pittsfield in the 1800s, entitled North Street, Pittsfield. 
Locals with enough money and bravery bought their own balloons and experimented. With anchored balloons or on a calm day, they'd try different types of ballasts and vents until they got to the point that they thought they were pretty good, good enough to justify a park just for ballooning. In 1902, the Aero Club of New England was founded in Boston, the first club for balloonists. So Aero Park was created on East Street in Pittsfield, at the corner of Newell Street, near the gas works, later part of GE, and later still, after some heavy cleanup from chemical contamination caused by GE, location of a baseball diamond. This spot was chosen because of the gas works itself. The gas works, in fact, offered the land for its use, and the gas work generously sold its product to fill the giant balloons at a small discount. There was really no way the gas works could lose in the deal. Ballooning became so big in northern Berkshire County that the location became the epicenter of the sport in the whole of the country. People would truck all of their gear in horse-drawn carts to Arrow Park and fill their balloons there. Crowds would always gather. Passers-by couldn't help but stop to watch. Appointments and schedules be damned, Berkshire County became the home base for the sport because of its inland distance from Boston and New York, and its safe distance from the ocean. Roughly 20 times balloons were launched from the park. It may not seem like many to us today, but back then, it was quite an astonishing undertaking. It's said that the first two people to take to the air in the Berkshires were Julian R. Thomas and his French ballooning friend, Charles Levy. A short time later, the two would accidentally become the first people to travel to 8,000 feet by air when their valve wouldn't open and they were caught in an updraft while ballooning in Augusta, Georgia. On the 10th of March, 1906, an attempt at the first ever balloon race in America took place from Arrow Park, but the balloons were heavily damaged when winds picked up as they were still being inflated and still lay half on the ground. That same year, but they didn't give up. And on October 22nd, the first balloon race in the U.S. did take place, and it began from Arrow Park in Pittsfield. Two balloons, one called the Centaur and the other one called Le Orient, took to the air. The aim of the race was that the first car to reach the chase balloon won the prize. The balloons were swept northward, so the cars followed, chasing them all the way to Bennington, Vermont, where the balloon called the Centaur set down. Twenty-five minutes later, the driver of one of the cars was able to figure out where the balloon had landed and arrived on site, and so won the race. Le Orient kept going northward until it finally landed in Jamaica, Vermont. In November of 1906, there was a race between a balloon and 35 Berkshire cars for a prize called the Wendell Cup. By Berkshire cars, I mean that they were made at the Berkshire Automobile Company of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. The balloon crew, made up of Homer Hedge, Leo Stevens, and Sam Butler, began to fill the balloon, but it took what seemed like forever for them to finally be ready. By then, the weather had changed, but not enough to stop the race. The balloonists entered the basket and the cars readied at the starting lines. Just before the announcer shouted, Let her go! So they did. The balloon took to the air, and the cars roared away along the road. Again, the aim of this race was a little strange, but of course this had never really happened before. The cars and the balloons would start at the same time. The balloon would be whisked away by the wind, and land somewhere far off. The first car to reach it, within 45 minutes after its landing, won the race. In two and a half hours, the balloon made it to Long Island Sound, and at 7 p.m. landed at Short Beach, 156 miles from where they'd come. The change in weather had turned into a storm, which swept them further than expected, and if they hadn't hurried to land, they feared they might have been swept out to sea. As for the cars, the weather, and then sunset, made it impossible for them to locate the now-landed balloon. 
and the 45-minute window passed, without any of them discovering where it had touched down. So, the balloonists won the race. A film of the beginning of this race does exist. Thanks to the publicity of this event, more balloons arrived in the Berkshires. And those balloons became famous, often mentioned in the papers. And their names, like Centaur, were known far and wide. Another balloon that turned up a lot during my research was one called Heart of the Berkshires. However, I've seen it many times written Pittsfield Heart of the Berkshires. I'm not quite sure who had it right. Articles written on the same day, after the same race, will have the name quoted differently, but I believe either name to be very beautiful. New ballooning technology was hot, and not just to thrill seekers, but also to governments around the world, who were already starting to see its potential as a tool of war. In 1907, during May, Leo Stevens, and Henry Maroque ascended into the air from Pittsfield in the balloon called the Centaur. The balloon climbed so quickly, in fact, that the change in altitude allowed the gas inside to expand quickly, causing rips in the fabric of the balloon itself. From that great height, the balloon began to drop. Horrified, the two men threw everything they had over the side to slow the speed at which they were falling, right down to their clothing. They saved the anchor, however, which they would need, for as soon as they were close enough to use it, they pitched it over the edge, where it caught the side of a tree, in the town of Mansfield, Massachusetts. The balloon jerked to a stop in the sky, and the man lowered themselves quickly by use of the anchor rope. The balloon, now free of passengers, and much lighter, fought against its tether, but in doing so, only tore bigger holes in the side of its canvas. It was sadly ruined beyond repair, but the men were safe. In July of 1908, a small group of Lennoxites, with some pocket money to burn, bought another balloon and all the necessary kit for use at Arrow Park. In Pittsfield, on the 29th of July, 1908, the balloon called Heart of the Berkshires lifted into the air Leo Stevens, Alan R. Howley, and C. R. Van Sickle were all in the basket, but as the balloon floated calmly through the sky, it crossed an updraft so powerful that it was whisked to 7,000 feet. Some of the gas was let out in an attempt to lower it, but the balloon kept going upward. At 10,000 feet, the draft stopped and the balloon began to drop at a frightening rate. They descended quickly from the sky over a farm in Dalton, Massachusetts, but there were men working in the field, and one of them was driving a tractor. The sound of the tractor engine was so that the man driving it couldn't hear the balloonists shouting at him to get out of the way, because they were headed right for him. Luckily, the man on the tractor turned his head just enough, and at just the right time, to notice the strange object falling toward him from the sky, and leapt from the tractor and a terrible fate. The basket hit the tractor, and the balloonists were thrown from it onto the ground. They were all roughed up quite a bit, but everyone was for the most part okay. On August 10th, William Van Sleet was accidentally overcome by gas. When he tried to fix a stuck valve on his balloon, the balloon, the heart of the Berkshires, was only partially inflated when it was noticed that the rope that hangs down the center of the balloon, the rope that was needed to open the valves which controlled descent, wasn't correctly placed. So Van Sleet climbed up the outside of the balloon, clinging to the exterior netting to open that valve so that he could reach inside and fix the rope. As he did this, however, he breathed in too much of the gas that was used to fill the balloon and became ill. He was able to make it back down to the ground before collapsing. After being checked out by doctors, who were there to witness the flight, he insisted that he was all right, and that he would be well enough to go up. This may have been mostly because this was to be the first flight of his co-pilot, Sidney S. Stowell, and he didn't want to let his friend down. By 1908, the North Adams Airfield 
had seen 25 balloon launches. By August the 5th, it was decided that there should be the first ever point-to-point -point race in America on August the 14th. It would also be only the fourth race with more than two balloons in the U.S. The point of a point-to-point -point race was that the balloonist had to try to predict which town they'd land in before even taking off, and then land within 10 miles of that town's post office. The town they chose had to also be at least 30 miles from the starting line, if not more. The trophy would be presented by Mr. A. Holland Forbes, a balloonist himself. Quite a few balloons entered this race. These included Heart of the Berkshires, Sky Pilot, and North Adams No. 1. The winner was the balloon called North Adams No. 1, flown by Mr. Arthur D. Potter of Greenfield, Massachusetts. With him for this ride was A. Holland Forbes himself and Natalie, his 12-year-old daughter. They landed just five miles from the post office of their intended destination, the village of Haydenville in the town of Williamsburg, Massachusetts. There were in fact enough balloons in the air in 1908 to cause a bit of confusion for on on October on October the 21st the balloon called Pittsfield Heart of the Berkshires was set up for a flight at Arrow Park William Van Sleet and Sidney Stowell would be aboard as they waited for the balloon to inflate some other members of the balloon club left Arrow Park in a car their task was to end up in the place where the balloon would land, so that the balloon could be packed up inside and driven back again. The wind had been measured, and it was presumed that the balloon would be pulled toward the city of Troy, New York. So the club members in the car headed there. When the balloon took to the air, it drifted as expected westwardly. Slowly at first, before the wind picked up a little. After its journey, it landed slightly off target in Cohoes, New York having never caught a glimpse of their clubmates in the car. The car, however, had seen the balloon. The balloon had somehow gotten ahead of the car as it sped along a road toward the border. It dipped in and out of view as it passed behind the hills and trees there, but as the car reached the Sand Lake area and headed up 66, the actual Pittsfield heart of the Berkshires was spotted over Troy. Two balloons? Balloons were well known, but there still weren't that many of them. The odds of there being two balloons on a close enough route at the same time in such a way that they could be confused by the chase car, the odds were very low. Well, those odds were very low. So where did the other balloon end up? We don't know where it landed for sure, but the Associated Press picked up the story of the Pittsfield Heart of the Berkshires flight and listed it as being seen passing over Albany, New York at 1 p.m., Schenectady, New York at 2 p.m., and having landed in Cohoes at 1.43 p.m. It's easy enough to notice that that timetable doesn't make sense, and the fact that Pittsfield heard the Berkshires never passed over Albany or Schenectady would indicate that that's the route the other balloon took. Not far away, in Springfield, Massachusetts, on October 8th of 1908. Aeronaut Leo Stevens took to the air with two friends, but soon after the trip began, a problem developed. A valve became stuck, and as they got higher, the gas inside the balloon began to expand, and the balloon looked like it was ready to pop. So, Leo was forced to climb out of the basket and try to reach the safety valve but his hands were too busy holding onto the rigging to keep him from falling from the balloon. The only way he could open the valve was with his teeth. The balloon set down safely in Granby. The balloon set down safely in Granby. Amherst College was the first place in the U.S. to create an air marking on March 31st of 1909, when letters 35 feet across were created, which spelled out the college's name on the ground. 
so that they could be read from far above and inform balloonists as to what it was they were flying over. On May 10, 1909, Charles J. Glibben of Boston took eggs up in a balloon with him to demonstrate how easy it might be to drop bombs accurately onto a target. After just a few practice drops, from his chosen height of a mile, he showed that it could be indeed done, and rather easily too. While on his way to Indianapolis to officiate an international balloon race there, he stopped in Pittsfield to talk with other balloonists about his experiments. On June 19, 1909, a couple, Roger Burnham and Eleanor Waring, married the day before in Woods Hole, then hurried inland by train. They climbed aboard the balloon Pittsfield Heart of the Berkshires in the city of Pittsfield and rose into the sky for the first ever aerial honeymoon in America. They said they didn't care how long they remained in the air, nor where they landed. They were just thrilled at the adventure. William Van Sleet was pilot. On August 13th, 1909, a reporter with the evening news from Bear, Vermont, was the first Vermont woman to ride in a balloon. Mrs. Edith I. Sawyer was a passenger in the famous Berkshire County balloon, Heart of the Berkshires, piloted by William Van Sleet. She was not, however, the first woman to ride in a balloon, nor the first woman to ride in a balloon in Vermont. She was the first Vermont woman to ride in a balloon. A balloon that happened to be from the Berkshires. Cortland Bishop of Lennox, a supporter and member of the ballooning club, was convinced by his wife, Mrs. Bishop, to take up the sport. And it was in some part his doing that created Arrow Park in Pittsfield, and he and his friends that gifted a balloon to the park. His wife, as well as her friend Mrs. Edgar, flew so often with him that they had no fear of possible danger at all. Their bravery was considered uncommon at the time. On November 19th of 1910, windy weather changed the plans of Leo Stevens and his passengers, four Williams College students. The balloon, called the Cleveland, had to wait until the wind died back. When the coast looked clear, the balloon was inflated and the group climbed into the sky over North Adams. Then, suddenly, the winds picked back up again and the crew was swept away at a great speed. They had little control for over three and a half hours. When they found themselves near Providence, Rhode Island, the balloon started to sink when it was coming over a lake. Fearful of landing in the water, the men dumped everything they could to lighten the basket, right down to their clothing. They got enough elevation for just long enough that they missed the lake by mere feet and came to a jarring landing on the opposite shoreline. The balloon bounced at least once and injured H.P. Sherman. The others escaped with only bumps and bruises. By June 3, 1911, Williams College had started the Williams College Aeronautical Society and held the first ever intercollegiate balloon race which took off from North Adams. Teams from Dartmouth, MIT, University of Pennsylvania, and of course Williams College all entered balloons in the race. Leo Stevens acted as referee. The balloon, Philadelphia II, entered by the University of Pennsylvania, traveled 115 miles while spending seven hours in the air before landing in West Peabody, Massachusetts, and so won the cups for duration and distance. By September 23rd of 1914, I found Aero Park mentioned in an article as the former Aero Park. The article, however, expressed the local desire to restart balloon versus automobile races. On July 13, 1916, Aero Park was back in action, and A. Leo Stevens of New York took off from there and landed in East Heartland, Connecticut. But not only that, he also reached a height of 25,000 feet, and his passenger jumped from the balloon at 2,100 feet and drifted safely to the ground after deploying a parachute. Then, 
World War I began, and the number of balloonists exploded. But those new balloonists were soldiers, and the balloons were used over the battlefield to scout across enemy lines. Unfortunately, due to the unpredictability of their travel, balloons were mostly tethered at the end of long ropes, so the people inside wouldn't end up drifting over enemy lines and into enemy hands. But this also made balloons very easy targets for snipers. At the same time, airplanes were changing, becoming quicker and more agile. They too were being used for scouting, and even for primitive dogfights and bomb drops, dogfights that first started with pistols and soon progressed to machine guns. Airplanes would soon become the preferred weapon of this guy. It was on September 5th of 1921 that Eugene M. Stafford planned to show off a fantastic stunt. A double parachute drop during the North Adams Fair, he traveled in his balloon to a height of 1,000 feet and then jumped from the basket. His first parachute opened and the crowd held their breath. He descended gently to 600 feet before daringly slicing through the ropes of the first parachute. Once free and falling again, he pulled at the second chute, but the entire harness he was wearing let go instead, leaving him without a parachute at all. The horrified crowd cried out as they watched him fall to the earth. This stunt was his last. It was on May 22nd of 1930 that Goodyear delivered a dirigible to the New England Airship Company of New Bedford, Massachusetts. It was the first ever for private use, but unlike ballooning, a dirigible could be steered. Bird and Son used it to make 1,308 flights over the Northeast. It wasn't until about the Second World War that the use of huge zeppelins and dirigibles became feasible in aerial combat situations. In the 1950s, it became more affordable and safer to use hot air to achieve lift. Lightweight burners could be fixed above the baskets and offered more control over the trip. When the hot air inside the balloon cooled or was released to lower the balloon, the burner could be turned on and reheat the air inside, easily causing the balloon to go up again. When lighter than air gases were released, they were simply gone and could not be replaced during that trip. Soon, gas-filled balloons became much more uncommon than their hot air counterparts. Since then, ballooning can happen anywhere. It's not necessary to make sure that you're near a gas works. This meant that the use of hot air balloons spread out in Pittsfield, North Adams, the Berkshires, were no longer the center of this sport. Aero Park is still a park, after not being a park for a while. There's a baseball diamond and jungle gyms there now. North Adams doesn't host balloon races like it used to, but balloons haven't altogether vanished from the scene. They're still a rare treat, sometimes visible over our mountains. This sport is more common in Hampshire County, but there's no reason that it couldn't come back and to become more popular in the Berkshires again. There's nothing like it, really. What a fine way to see our beautiful mountains, quietly sweeping across the landscape from so high above. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. For pictures depicting Berkshire history every day, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. You can find more episodes on Facebook by looking for us on YouTube or by visiting our website www.theberkshiresgoneby.com where you can see more pictures pertaining to each individual episode. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening! <laughs>